Father, we come to you, having just read your word, and we ask that you would now show your Son and show your glory through these words, that um, your Spirit would already have been uh, beginning its work this morning for each of us, for me speaking, and for each of those sitting in this room hearing. We ask, God, that this would be a time of worship toward you as we continue um, from singing into now studying your word. I ask that um, you would show us glorious and wonderful things as we look through it. We pray these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. So uh, you may recall a few weeks ago, uh, Pastor Michael finished up the sermon just before this one, which was on the spiritual disciplines. Do you remember this? And he, he spent four weeks talking about prayer and the word and fasting and these things. And he had this peculiar illustration to introduce each sermon. And they were all sports illustrations. Do you remember this? Now, I'm not a big sports guy, so I was waiting for this. There was this per- Here was his point. His point was that you have to have these fundamentals that you continue practicing. So in basketball, what do you practice most of the time? You practice dribbling and shooting your free throws. Um, I didn't know that, but he told me that on that Sunday when he was preaching, so now I know. Um, in golf, it's the same thing. You're focusing on the posture of the swing, which I do not know, as you know, because I, I swung my hips out like that. That's not how you play golf. I don't think. Um, and so this is, he, he had these illustrations. They were awesome. But there was one that I was waiting for that never arrived. And maybe you were waiting for this too. I was waiting for the orchestra. <laughs> maybe not. Um, but it's, I mean, it's exactly the same thing. There are these fundamental scales and etudes that you're going through over and over again. And they make you a better player so that you can play the hard stuff easy because you know what a chromatic scale is. Now, now that I'm done showing off, I want to remedy the fact that this is yet to make an introduction from Pastor Michael, and I'm going to use it this morning, but in a different context, um, because there's this, there's this unique aspect of orchestras and bands and these musical ensembles that get together. Um, if you've ever listened to the Kansas City Symphony and, and a fifth grade band, there's a difference there, and it's not just in sound quality. But, um, and Jared and Chelsea may know this, but it's in how many different parts there are going on in the, in the different songs. The fifth graders, you're going to have three or four lines. The drums are doing da, 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 da the whole time. And then there's a melody and a harmony, and that's pretty much it. Um, and that's, that's the whole fifth grade band. So you have all these players, but they're pretty much playing the exact same thing. And they're all out of tune, so it's not that great. Um, but you're, you're hearing it, and it's, it's, it's a good song. But compared to the Kansas City Symphony, where it seems each individual player is almost playing their own separate thing from everybody else, and it comes together, and it sounds fuller, it sounds more beautiful, and it sounds united, but in a different way. You see, the the uniqueness of each individual part makes the whole song sound more fuller, so that if you're listening to Stravinsky's Firebird or Dvorak, you're listening to these pieces, they, they sound gorgeous. And it's because you can't hear everything going on in them. And so this is a kind of, of what we're seeing here in this passage. Paul is looking at the local church, and he wants us to stand unified here at Providence as one body. But that doesn't mean that we should all be doing the same things. But rather, like a symphony, we all have our individual parts to play that make the song, the mission of our local church, sound more beautiful and more full. And so as we've been going through the book of Ephesians, Pastor Michael has showed us again and again this movement from death to life. And he's offered up Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 as a thesis statement. And I want to read that just briefly. Paul writes at the beginning of this letter, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with uh, with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. And so as he's talked about these spiritual blessings, he spent the first two chapters saying, here's another way that God has blessed you in Christ. Here's another way that God has blessed you in Christ. He brought you from death into life. He didn't make bad people good. He made dead people alive. That's impossible. That's something only Jesus could have done. And Paul has now arrived at a point at the end of chapter 3 where he closes in this doxology. Do you remember this from last week? He, he, he's talking about all this awesome information but then it moves him almost to tears. He's on his knees writing this letter, praising God for his work to bring a nation out of every nation. And then he hits chapter four. And the tone is is shockingly different almost. 
It's been all like up here in the sky and oh, praise God, it's amazing all the stuff that he's, and now he's like, all right, here's what I want you to do. Um, we're, we're gonna get down on the ground. We're gonna talk about how to do this. But this is a movement that's very common in the scripture, especially the New Testament. Who we are, or here's what Pastor Michael has said, our geography changes our actions. It changes who we are, it changes what we do. So who we are changes how we act. You're not a sinner because you've sinned. You sin because you're a sinner. You're not saved because you did good stuff. You're, you, you, we obey Christ because we have been saved. This is the movement that we see in the New Testament very often, and this is the movement of the book. The first three chapters, here is what God has done for you. The last three chapters, here's how we should respond. It's uh, the fancy words for this, indicative to imperative. Here's all the stuff you should know, and here's what you should do about it. And so now we are in the imperative section. We are in the application section. He has moved from head knowledge to heart knowledge now. What should we be doing? What should we, we be doing? And so for people like Ron that are small picture, this is perfect. This is exactly what you've been looking for. Um, this, is, this is great. And so um, as we will see in, in this first passage, in, in the second half of Ephesians, um, I've broken down a single sentence um, that I think summarizes the whole chapter. And so if you put all four of these clauses together, they make one full sentence that's easy to remember. So that if M Michael comes back next week and asks you what you learned, you have a sentence to give him. This is what we learned. And that's what we are doing this morning. So as a family of Christians, we are to apply the gospel, the good news, to our diverse perspectives in order to become mature in Christ. So first we see that we are a family of Christians. Let's read verses 1 through 3. Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So Paul is reminding the Ephesians here in these, in these opening verses that he's, he's not, he, notice first, he's, he addresses them not as an apostle, not as their boss, but as a prisoner in the Lord, which is what he's been talking about in all chapter three. I am a prisoner in the Lord. I'm not just somebody on the sidelines telling you, here's what you should be doing as I drink my coffee and I'm gonna tell you what to do. He's somebody who has skin in the game. And so he's talking to them as somebody who has already given so much for them, and he reminds them that it's Jesus who is urging them to take this letter and to apply it, not just in their family, not just at their church, but in every sphere of life, in every sphere of life. In verse 1, he writes, Therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord, I urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received. Remember, this calling is not not just salvation, but this calling is a calling to holiness. It's always tied together with, with holy lifestyle kind of language in this letter. And so he's calling them to, to be who they are, to act like what they've already happened. And this is opposite from what you're gonna hear in most movies and maybe even in most churches. Um, how many of you have seen or heard of Batman Begins? Batman Begins, the movie, yeah, the, okay, the Batman movie. Uh, hence Batman Begins. Uh, there's this great line, there's this great conversation that, that happens, and it's, it comes at a key point in the story where Bruce Wayne, who hasn't yet become Batman, is, is getting ready to do something really shady, and his childhood friend Rachel finds out. And, and Rachel, she, she finds out that he's, he's about to do this, and she is just infuriated with him. She like can't control it. She like starts hitting him in the car, and, and she just says, it's not who you are underneath but it's what you do that defines you. It's not who you are underneath, but it's what you do that defines you. That's, that's an okay sentiment. That's, that's fine. And it, I mean, it works really well in the movie. It's great. But that's not really what is happening here, is it? It's not what they do that defines them, but it's who they are. Uh, I, I've heard a pastor put it this way. Who God is defines what he did. And what he did changes who we are and that changes what we do. So when we sit in a room as Christians and we start talking about ethics and morals, we're not doing it from this position of you gotta get your act together, pull yourself up by your bootstraps because the train is going and you need to jump on. That's not 
the image that we see in the New Testament. The image in the New Testament is Christ has given everything to get you on the train. Now you're just on board going along with what he's called us to do. Do you see that distinction? I hope that's clear. It's not, we're not working to earn our salvation. We're not working to earn our right standing before God. It's Christ who has worked. It's Christ who has offered freely to us this standing. So the Ephesians, when Paul is urging them, commanding them to apply this letter, he's, he's doing so not from a position of, all right, now get your act together. We need to do this. This is a church that's actually doing really well. This is maybe the, the best church that he writes to, except for maybe the church in Philippi. This is a great church that's going on here. So he's writing to them, not out of the sense of, you're doing wrong things, you need to get your act together. But it's this, it's this sense of, look at what Christ has done for you. Now how do we respond to this grace that he has shown us? Especially towards those in the local church. So he will, talk, he will take each sphere of life um, over the coming weeks. But for today, he's talking about relationships in the local church. So as we think about this, we need to be thinking about family relationships, but more specifically, we need to be thinking about our relationships here at Providence. And the first thing he encourages them is to be humble and gentle, this kind of, of kindness and, and tenderness towards one another. But he's also encouraging us to be patient, which means that even though we all have things that that write us up the tree, the, the, the things that really just drive us nuts about other uh, people in the local church. Patience in a family of Christians means that we put up with that stuff, not by ignoring our differences. I, I think if you have a problem with somebody and you just ignore it and wait for it to go away, that never works. It's, but that's not what he's asking us to do. He's, it's this loving relationship with one another where if there's a problem, you go to them and you say, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but it seems like you really don't like me. Can we talk about that? It's that kind of, not confrontation, but that kind of willingness to engage with one another that is required to be part of a healthy church. And so the first application question is this. Do humility and patience describe your attitude towards other people at Providence? When you think about your relationships with other people in this room or people that aren't here but are normally sitting in the pew maybe near you or on the other side of the room on purpose, uh, if, if there is, if, if you look at those relationships, do, are they characterized by humility and patience or by pride and and anger. I want us to be thinking about that. So we are a family of Christians, but more specifically, we are a family of Christians who are to apply the gospel. As a family of Christians, we are to apply the gospel. Let's look at verses 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in all. So the Ephesians, he, this, is, this is a kind of a nice, in, in my text it has this divvied up like a poem almost, and I wish it would did that in every translation, but that's okay. Um, there's this nice movement of, of one body and one spirit, just as the one hope that you have, the one Lord, one baptism. I mean, that should be like slapping you in the face. It's so obvious kind of uh, mentality. This, this one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Therefore, we should be living as one people. That's his point. We are one body because it's the same spirit who is at work in all of us. We were all saved by the same gospel message. Jesus is the only one in whom we have believed. There's no other savior but him. And because of that, there should be no other body of believers that we are a part of. The Father, he, He's reigning over us. He is sovereign over us. He's transforming us from within, and He is redeeming our spheres of influence through our obedience. It says that He's one God and Father of all, and He's above us. He's reigning over us. He's in control even when you're not. He's working through us. So the people that you interact with as you live out and apply the gospel, their lives are, are changed by the fact that you're so gracious towards them. And he's working in us. He's working in all of us, changing and maturing and transforming us from the inside out so that 
we not only are doing better things, but we want to do the right thing, which is a much harder task. And so the second application question is this. I may ask you, I may ask you individually, does your life reflect the gospel of grace, the good news that, that Jesus saves? And you, you will probably say, mostly, yes, I think so, I hope so, on a good day, those kinds of things. But what if I asked your spouse if, if the gospel was, was apparent and clear in your life? What if I asked your children that? Kids, what if I asked your parents? What if I asked your coworkers or your neighbors? Does your life just ooze the gospel? Does it ooze the good news of God's grace shown towards you? Or are you kind of harsh and moralistic towards people and you say, well, you know what, you should just get your act together. Do, do we reflect the gospel in our actions towards others or are we hardened towards it? We need to be applying the gospel in each of these relationships, and especially in our relationships in the local church. So he applies this to our diverse perspectives here. And, and diversity has, is kind of like a bad word these days, and, and I get that, and I don't use it with all of the connotations that it carries. Um, but there is a, there's a clear um, expectation of these different gifts that are being applied together, these different unique gifts that are being unified and moving in one direction. And so I think the word diverse explains that pretty well. So uh, verses 7 through 10 of Ephesians 4. Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive, he gave gifts to people. But what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things. I remember the first time I went through the book of Ephesians, uh, I was in eighth grade or sophomore, I don't remember, it was too long ago, but verse nine especially made absolutely no sense to me. It's like, this is, this is how Paul is proving his point and it makes no sense. Uh, what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? What? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. Um, and, but it makes sense in the Old Testament context that he is referencing. So will you turn with me to Psalm 68. It's quite a ways back. It's usually like right smack dab in the middle. Psalm 68. Just a general rule. Whenever you read an Old Testament quote in the New Testament, in the CSB, they're always bolded like that. If, if you come across one of those, go back to the reference in the Old Testament and just read the whole chapter. Um, because the New Testament authors were very aware of the Old Testament, and they were reading it constantly. And so when he quotes Psalm 68 here, he has the whole psalm in the back of his mind. And it's confusing if you just have the single verse. So let's read the stanza that it comes from, verses 15 through 18 of Psalm 68. Mount Bashan is God's towering mountain. Mount Bashan is a mountain of many peaks. Why gaze with envy, you mountain peaks, at the mountain God desired for his abode? The Lord will dwell there forever. God's chariots are tens of thousands, thousands and thousands. The Lord is among them in the sanctuary as he was at Sinai. You ascended to the heights, taking away captives. You received gifts from people, even from the rebellious, so that the Lord God might dwell there. So you see the verse 18 is the one that's quoted, right? You ascended to the heights, taking away captives, you received gifts from people. This is the verse that Paul is quoting in Ephesians. And in its context, it's a little bit clear the picture that's happening. There are all these mountains around, but there's one mountain that's most special of all of them, and it's the mountain where God reigns. And then in verse 18, we see that there's somebody that is climbing this mountain leading like a, like a triumphal procession behind them. There's this marching army almost of victory, of people, captives that he's leading away captives, but these are more captives that he's freed. And he's leading them up to the throne room of God to go stand in his presence. And in Psalm 68, it says he's receiving gifts from people on his way. Paul just flips that around and says, he, it's actually more him giving gifts out. 
Because what Paul realizes is that not just anybody can approach the throne room of God. In Exodus 19, Moses goes up the mountain to talk to God, and the others try to follow, and and they almost die um, because they are about to stand on holy ground, and they're they're not ready. Not just anybody can approach the throne room of God. Paul is reading this, and he he realizes that this could only refer to one person. This could only refer to one man, one, one human being, and that person was Jesus. Jesus, the promised Messiah of the Old Testament. And so Paul has this revelation as he's reading Psalm 68. It's Jesus who is ascending to the heights, leading a train of captives behind him. And he is the one who's receiving gifts from people, but he's the one that is giving gifts out. And this is, this is the picture that Paul it has in mind as he's describing in Ephesians 4, this, this person ascending into heaven, giving out gifts to men. And he's saying this is what Jesus has done. In verse 9, what does it mean that he climbed except that he came down? The only person that can go into heaven is one who has come down from heaven. By the way, extra credit. In, in Psalm 68, if you, very few Bibles have like the New Testament quote reference in there. If you write down Ephesians 4 next to Psalm 68, that'll remind you that it's treated with in the New Testament, and that'll, that'll help you in your personal Bible study a lot. So do that. Um, but the picture is, is Jesus approaching heaven, and as he's going, he's giving gifts. And these gifts that he is giving to his, his people, to his church, are the leaders of the church. So the application, before we move into the final section of Ephesians 4, is this. How has God uniquely gifted you? How has God uniquely gifted you? There are some things that only you can do. There's a lot of things that we do here at Providence that really anybody could do. Anybody could step in and do it. And it's good to do some of those things. But there is something that God has uniquely gifted you to do. Fathers, you are the only father your children will ever have. Mothers, you are the only mother your children will ever have. And so we look at these relationships and we need to prioritize. We need to be really careful. What are the gifts? What is the stewardship that God has given to you that is most important? And how are you being faithful in that? So as a family of Christians, we apply the gospel to our diverse perspectives in order so that for the reason of becoming mature in Christ, in order to become mature in Christ. Verse 11, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, equipping the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. So the different gifts that Jesus has given the Ephesians, has given to the Christians in Ephesus, they are people that are missionaries, like Paul, somebody who is going across the world to bring the gospel to people who have never heard. Somebody started that church in Ephesus, and and they have them to be thankful for. There's also uh, preachers, pastors. um, uh, The word he uses here is prophets. Like Titus, somebody who's willing to say a hard thing before a congregation, to tell them not what's for just because they want to and want to make somebody feel bad, but because they love them and they want to encourage them. He gave them, Jesus has given the Ephesian church evangelists like Timothy, somebody who's bold in their faith, not afraid to talk about what they believe with those that might disagree, not afraid to love those who have nothing to give in return. And... He has given the church in Ephesus pastor teachers. These are probably referring to the same role, this kind of shepherd teacher with a hyphen in between, this, this function of somebody who's going to not just plant a church and then move on, but somebody who's going to stick around, 
somebody who's going to be here, who's going to live life with you, somebody who's going to be there with you. But notice what the job description is for each of these. It's, it's interesting how we treat uh, pastors someday. Um, and I was having a conversation with Michael about this this week, and this was, I thought, a really good illustration um, that he shared. When, when there's, a, there's a plumbing issue at, at your house, who do you call? You call the plumber. If you have a, a health concern or a, a health issue, who do you go see? The doctor. That was a trick question. <laughs> That's tricky. Uh, if you have a problem with the law, who do you go see? A lawyer, if you can afford it. Um, and these are the people that we go to. And if you have a spiritual problem, who do you go see? You go see a pastor, right? But that's not really, in fact, it's almost opposite of what Paul is calling us to do as a local church. The pastor uh, is, is in charge of equipping the saints for the work of ministry. The, the pastor's job is more like a coach, more like a trainer, somebody who's preparing you to answer those tough questions for others. It's, it's not the one guy who's a priest and everybody else just shows up and, and, doesn't, and feels better and then goes home. That's not the idea in the New Testament. The idea is that the community of Christians comes together, they encourage one another, the pastor equips them, and they go out, they are sent out into their neighborhoods to be the church in their own context, in their own spheres of influence. And so that is how the different gifts, the different leaders that Jesus has given to this church, that's how they are to operate. They're to train up us. They're to help us grow and help us be pastors to our own families and, and to our own neighborhoods and to our own co-workers. This is their task. They're not just there to take care of our spiritual problems like a doctor or a lawyer. The mission, verse 13, the mission of any local church, we, we read in, in these verses, until we all reach unity in the faith first, reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son. Second, grow into maturity. And, and third, match the measure that Christ has sent. Um, there's, a, there's a fancy way of saying this that I first heard on the radio, and I wish I could remember who said it because it's great. Um, but it's, it's this. And I, and I think it's present in this verse, which is why I bring it up. Maturity in a local church looks like unity in the essentials, liberty in the in the non-essentials, and charity in everything. Let me use 20, 21st century words. Uh, unity in the things that are most important. We need to stand together on the things that are most important. On the things that are still important, but not like gospel issues, there needs to be some freedom there. There needs to be a little bit of wiggle room. With the kind of music that you sing on Sunday morning, there needs to be a little bit of wiggle room there. Not a lot. We're not going to come up here and sing Bon Jovi. But there needs to be some wiggle room there. But in everything, regardless of how we see these, the difference between what's essential and what's not essential, in everything, we need to show love towards one another. We have to show kindness towards one another. Even if you vehemently disagree with somebody, you have to show kindness towards them. So Paul knows that even the oldest believers in Ephesus are in danger of leaving the faith. This is a great church, as I've mentioned before. This is a, a mature church, but they are still in danger of being little children who are tossed back and forth by different ones of doctrine. This new teaching comes into town. They're like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And then somebody comes in, no, I will show you the true meaning of Scripture. Okay, uh, that's interesting. And no, you, you've missed the boat all along. And, and his point is that we should... We should be equipped so, as that, so that we can, we can know what the true course is as we study the scriptures ourselves. That we know what is trustworthy, what is sound doctrine. The goal for believers is to become more and more like Christ every day in our motivations, our intentions, our actions, our thoughts, our words, what we do with our free time. And that means, verse 15, that we are to do everything with honesty, speaking the truth, and we are to do everything with kindness, speaking love. And I fear that in our culture today, it's very hard to do both of these things. 
You usually have to pick one or the other, don't you? Or at least it feels that way. Either I'm going to tell this person, I'm going to be bold, I'm going to say what's true, no matter what, no matter the consequences, I'm just going to tell them what the truth is and I'm going to let them figure it out. If they don't like it, that is their problem. Or, on this side, you want to be kind and you're afraid that if you say anything, it's going to hurt their feelings. And, or even worse, they might not like you anymore. And so you just... Okay, well, uh, whatever you want, whatever you want to do. But there's this interesting, there's this, there's this third option that Jesus provides. And, and we read about this in John chapter 1, verse 14. It says that Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. That doesn't mean that he was like 50% grace and 50% truth. It doesn't mean that he chose grace sometimes and sometimes he chose truth. It means that he was 100% grace. He was 100% truth. Never, Jesus never told a lie. And Jesus never told the truth in an unloving way. Jesus never was hateful towards somebody. He got angry, rightfully so, but he never hated somebody. He didn't hate a single person. He was full of grace and full of truth. And we need to be imitators of Christ, which means that we must be totally honest as to the best of our ability, but that we must be absolutely kind. So I know that there are some in this room that lean more towards the truth, harsh, bitter side. That's, that's me. Uh, this side here. And I know there are some here that, that are the, the love side that want to just have a relationship with somebody above all else. I'm not telling you that there has to be a compromise. That's actually the opposite of the problem. I think that causes a lot of issues. I think we have to be honest all the time, and I, but I think we have to be kind the whole time too. So the last application question, is it harder for you to speak truth or to speak love? In order to imitate Jesus, who was full of grace and truth, what do you need to learn about the opposite? So, as a family of Christians, we apply the gospel to our diverse perspectives in order to become mature in Christ. As we continue through the book of Ephesians, uh, Michael will show us uh, the different relationships with those who are not Christians, um, those who are not members of our local church, how we are to interact with them. He's going he's gonna to talk about um, fathers and children and wives and husbands and even slavery. So this is, this is just ramping up even more intensely. Um, the, let me close with this. As we, we've been kind of dancing around um, the gospel and, and and I, I want to make sure that we are not that we are clear, that we are explicitly clear on what we mean by that. The gospel isn't about how you need to act now in order to be a Christian. The gospel is about what Christ has done for you. You see, you were, we all were left in this in this helpless state. We were in need of of something, of of somebody. We didn't know what, but we needed something, and and that something was God. And it would have been all too easy for God to look on us and say, that's too much, that I can do something about it, but they're not really worth it. It would have been too easy to do that. But God didn't abandon us. He didn't abandon you in your sin. He is with you. He sent his only son to be a, one of us, to live the life that none of us could live, to die a death that we deserved, and to pay the penalty for our sin because the Bible teaches that the wages of sin is death. Unless we all look ahead to not just death of a physical kind, but an eternal death, Jesus did something about that to change things. And not only that, he didn't just die for us, but he rose from the dead so that we could have life with him if we place our faith with him. If we die with him and are raised with him, we will share in his life. So if you haven't done that, I invite you to do so today. Like I said, I will be up here as long as I need to be. So feel free to come and, and ambush me with all your questions. Um, that's why I'm here. Uh, let's pray and we will conclude our service. Father, we, we thank you. Um, and we ask that you would be with us this week as we go. Help us to apply the gospel in each sphere of, our, of influence, but help us especially to apply it in our relationships with others in this local church. 
We pray this in Jesus' mighty name.